from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. German prosecutors have filed a request to a regional court for the extradition of former Catalan leader Carles Puigdemont to Spain. Prosecutors say Spain's extradition request was admissible because accusations of rebellion included carrying out an anti-constitutional referendum. A higher regional court will now rule on Puigdemont's fate. He will remain in custody until then. And protesters took to the streets of Berlin to demand Puigdemont's release. The Catalan leader was detained in Germany on his way back to Belgium after visiting Finland. He fled to Belgium five months ago after Spanish Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy dismissed his regional administration. The federal prosecutor of Schleswig-Holstein has applied for an extradition order at the Schleswig-Holstein Higher Regional Court. Now, the higher regional court has to decide. Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza has asked Switzerland to stop hostile economic sanctions. In a formal note, Arreaza said the sanctions violate fundamental principles, the United Nations Charter Agreement that both countries have signed. He said the move reflects Switzerland's subordination to the European Union and the U.S., who have both also imposed sanctions on Venezuela. Last Wednesday, Switzerland ordered an asset freeze and travel ban for Venezuelan companies, organizations and dignitaries, including seven Venezuelan ministers and high-ranking officials. It's been a year since violent opposition protests rocked Venezuela, and although peace has been restored on the streets, justice for some of those who lost their lives as a result of right-wing violence has yet to be won. Freddie Gillingham has more. For Louise Duran, last year's opposition protests brought back old memories which he had temporarily put to rest. It was on this very crossroads in eastern Caracas back in 2014 that his son, Elvis, aged just 29 years old, was decapitated. The first call I received, I said to his twin brother that they said his brother was killed. He thought it was a joke. Then there was another call, but it was a girl, who told me that my son had been killed. So his brother said we should go and see if it was true. I took a taxi, the streets were empty, I arrived quickly. I found his body lying on the ground, decapitated. Venezuela's violent opposition protests, better known as the Gorimbas, saw a surge in 2014. Attacks against public property, government buildings and public transport were common tactics. But the civil unrest didn't stop there, as Elvis Duran tragically discovered. Luis has since sought justice for his son's murder, leading the committee of victims group. They are murderers who ordered to put down these traps to kill people. They are murderers, like General Ángel Vivas. These were acts of war. But here actually there was no war or anything declared. There were just civilians who didn't know these military tactics, which were used against defenseless civilians. At the beginning of April last year, a new round of violence engulfed the country. Opposition leaders called for unrest after the Supreme Court declared the National Assembly in breach of the Constitution. Protests continued for four months, and over 100 people were killed. Scenes in this part of Caracas were very different at around this time of year last year. Peace has been restored for now, but the scars of those terrible months will certainly take a long time to heal. However, the opposition's violence has not paid off. Much of their ability to mobilize their support has diminished against what they call a fraudulent presidential election. Only a handful turned up. Still, many of those who organized the Kalimbas remain at large. Very few have been prosecuted, and with many foreign governments clearly on their side, some of them certainly hope they can take to the streets once again. Freddie Gillingham, Telesaur, 
Caracas. The peace talks between Colombia and the National Liberation Army, the ELN, seem to be moving forward. Monday marked the beginning of an assessment of a temporary bilateral ceasefire. Organizations including the United Nations and the Colombian Catholic Church are evaluating the last ceasefire so that a new one can be established. The previous ceasefire between Colombia and the ELN started last October and lasted for 101 days. A new opinion poll on the upcoming presidential elections in Colombia has been released by the Latin American Geopolitical and Strategic Center, the CELAG. The survey was conducted between February 22 and March 10, ending just one day before the legislative elections took place. The polls show an increase for former Bogota mayor Gustavo Petro, who has jumped from 17.6% to 22.9%, putting him in the lead. Ivan Duque holds on to his 18%, but that could go up to 25% if he secures the votes of supporters of his right-wing peers, Marta Lucia Ramirez and Andrés Ordóñez. Support for Sergio Fajardo has fallen to 17.6%, and support for Germán Vargas Lleras fell to 10.6%. Humberto de la Calle's share fell to 5.6%, while Piedad Córdoba held 4.4%. Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno has launched a new program to boost the country's economy. The plan will focus on promoting foreign investment, generating employment, tax reforms, and reducing public spending through 14 measures. There are also plans to restructure central government and increase productivity. Moreno says the program will not only stabilize the country's economy, it will preserve the right of the majority. Colombian media has released the first proof of life of the three Ecuadorian journalists kidnapped at the border with Colombia a week ago. In the video, the journalists say President Lenin Moreno holds their lives in his hands. They also explain their kidnappers want the release of three detainees in Ecuador and the annulment of the agreement between Colombia and Ecuador to fight terrorism. The team was kidnapped in the province of Esmeraldas in Ecuador while doing a report on how armed groups are affecting living conditions in the border towns. We'll take a short break now, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. The annual day commemorating veterans and those who lost their lives during the Malvinas War was held in Argentina on Monday. 36 years after the armed conflict between Argentina and the United Kingdom, ex-combatants and political figures reflected on the agreement signed by both countries after the war. Regardless of time, wounds remain open. Saúl and Gustavo, two ex-combatants who fought during the Malvinas War, think that the agreement signed by Argentina at the end of the war strongly favored the UK. Like many, 
They see the current government as doing little to challenge this injustice. I think the whole population of war veterans who fought in that war feel this way. This government is not defending our sovereignty. It keeps signing bilateral commercial agreements without letting us know. Mauricio Macri's government is continuing to engage in dialogue with the UK and ignores the issue of sovereignty regarding the Malvinas. Negotiations include the possibility of allowing flights from the island to other countries and the exporting of natural resources. This government clearly serves the British. This arrangement is economic development for them in the islands. This is the same as nullifying the previous agreement in favor of Great Britain. This agreement also allows Britain to interfere in fishing, sea navigation and oil production without any obstacles. This is something many sectors of society are strongly questioning. On April the 2nd, we must keep our flag flying high and use our constitutional right to ask our government to defend our sovereignty over the islands. What worries us is that the government won't protest with the same force. The Argentinian people are demonstrating once again the government's compromises, while President Macri keeps giving priority to commercial relations with the UK. And still in Argentina, one of the most successful soccer teams in the country is being investigated for running a pedophile ring. Club Atlético River Plate allegedly ran a pedophile ring between 2004 and 2011. The club is accused of taking underage soccer players to private apartments in exclusive sectors of Buenos Aires where they were asked to perform sexual acts for about $50. Local media say this may be just the beginning of a series of investigations into soccer clubs in Argentina. Bolivian authorities are denouncing an increase in political harassment against women who have been elected as political authorities. At least 28 cases of harassment have been filed in the first three months of the year. A correspondent in La Paz brings us more details. Allegations of political harassment against women have grown five times in the first three months of 2018 in comparison to 2017, according to the Electoral Tribunal of La Paz. We are facing an emergency. We need to stop these acts and this political harassment. 28 harassment cases were filed on the first month of this year, even though political parties had to comply with the Gender Equality Act, a commitment they made during electoral campaigns. They present women as figureheads and men as their substitutes. Then halfway through the term, they ask women to quit so that their substitute can take over. This situation greatly affects female mayors and council women especially in rural areas, in spite of legislations that protect gender equality and sanction political harassment. This also affects lawmakers and senators. I heard stories of women get mistreated, how they are insulted on a daily basis. They're told they're old, illiterate, and that they're worthless. This is what our sisters are dealing with. A council woman who obtained constitutional protection twice was even assassinated for speaking out about the issue. This situation has mobilized authorities and human rights organizations in La Paz. They are trying to build a strategy to protect the big victims of gender violence and inequality, despite the fact that the Bolivian legislation is considered one of the most advanced in the world when it comes to addressing this issue. In Guatemala, the Supreme Court of Justice will decide if it will remove Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales' immunity for his alleged responsibility in the death of 41 girls in a state home over a year ago. The court received the re-evaluation order on Monday and has five days to decide on the case. After the tragedy, Morales admitted the government knew that some of the girls and teenagers of the state home were locked in a small classroom. Relatives have continued to campaign for justice. The former dictator of Guatemala, Efraín Ríos Montt, has been buried in the capital, Guatemala City. Soldiers fired a salute and carried the coffin to a small private burial ceremony attended by family and close supporters. Rios Montt died on Sunday at the age of 91, and he came to power in a coup in 1982. He presided over one of the bloodiest periods of Guatemala's civil war. In all, some 200,000 people died 
many of them from indigenous communities, and over 90% at the hands of military and its militias. Without a doubt, he was the greatest military and political leader this country has had in the last century. Guatemala loses a great man today, no doubt. Protesters also came out to mark the death of Rios Montt. They included relatives of some of those who died under his rule. Rios Montt was convicted in 2013 of genocide and crimes against humanity for the massacre, rape and torture of more than 1,700 indigenous Ixil Mayans under a scorched earth policy implemented by his security forces. It's terrible that this person who was sentenced to 80 years in prison for genocide and crimes against humanity died peacefully in his house. But this country's legal system was complicit with that. We are angry, enraged in thinking that this man dies in his house, in his bed, surrounded by his relatives. And here we are demanding justice, saying that this will not be forgotten or forgiven. We will keep looking for our relatives, our aunts and uncles, our cousins, because the struggle for justice should continue. And in Chile, more student protests are planned in opposition to the country's increasingly profit-driven model of higher education. The move comes after a decision by the Constitutional Court to extend the country's market-based university system. Student groups arrived at City Hall to apply for official permission to hold their first national demonstration of the year. This decision to protest follows a recent Constitution Court ruling which rejected Article 63 of the new Higher Education Reform Law, thereby lifting the ban on for-profit individuals or entities controlling or owning universities. This decision by the Constitutional Court, aided by both the President and the Ministry of Education, shows that it's necessary for social movements to take to the streets. These sorts of decisions must be opposed. The declaration of the Constitutional Court is a total reversal of public opinion, which is very much in favor of eliminating of all types of profit-making in higher education. This move effectively rolls back over a year's worth of parliamentary discussion. The government is not doing anything to ban a for-profit model of education. We've been fooled all along. What they have done is protect the interests of Chilean businessmen who are out to make money from the educational system. Chile's Confederation of Students, along with high school students and the Teachers Association, are looking to hold a series of demonstrations to demand better public education. We will continue to demonstrate until the minimum requirements are met for teachers to be able to do their jobs, and until we're sure that universities won't be closed because they're in danger in the hands of the people that manage them. Social movements are attempting to join forces to oppose any further attempts to restore market-based measures in education. Social movements must remain united to fight against these backwards policies. Thousands are expected to take to the streets on April 19th to demand public education as a social right, thereby marking the start of a new year of student demonstrations. 24 Caribbean and Latin American countries have signed an agreement enabling public participation in environmental justice. The move will give the public much wider access to environmental records. This agreement states that a healthy environment is a basic human right and says environmental democracy is essential for ensuring that people have access to a healthy natural environment. The agreement, known as Principle 10, establishes that environmental issues are best dealt with when handled at the national level. The document was signed in Costa Rica early this year. In Panama, a rise in land value has boosted gentrification in neighborhoods usually inhabited by low-income people. Evictions are on the increase to make room for luxury properties and businesses such as restaurants, bars and hotels. From here, you can see the old town, the second city built by Panamanians. Today, the value of land is increasing, and residents are feeling the consequences. They're evicting all of the families that have lived here for years. I'm not talking about 20 years, 5 years, but 40 or 50 years of residence. They're kicking them out. 
Before, there were more than 7,000, maybe 8,000 families, and right now there are maybe 500 families remaining. The rest have been sent far away. Real estate projects are being announced that exceed $1 million, while the sites, which were previously inhabited by families, have now become the headquarters of exclusive businesses. I think this is happening because the government doesn't care. They are not interested in poor people. People clearly don't matter as the government is moving to evict people in order to build bars, hotels and restaurants. The same phenomenon is happening elsewhere, such as in the province of Colón, where an urban renewal project began with the eviction of residents, something that experts are linking to the increase in the value of land. This is a product of the economic potential that is being determined for this land. They blatantly disregard the Panamanian residents who have lived here for generations, and they're just kicking them out. In a country where the housing deficit exceeds 150,000 housing units, it becomes clear that with the developing threat of gentrification, the country falls short of serving its citizens. We'll take another short break, but join us after this look at what a multimedia team reports. My husband has been fighting for the liberation of the African people, for the working harmoniously of all the Welcome back. South Africans have been paying tribute to anti-apartheid act activist Winnie Mandela, who died on Monday at the age of 81. She was the former wife of the country's first black president, Nelson Mandela. Winnie and Nelson were a symbol of the anti-apartheid struggle for decades. However, in her later years, her reputation took a hit from corruption scandals. Still, love for her didn't fade away. Even President Cyril Ramaphosa paid her his tribute. Despite the hardship she faced, she never doubted that the struggle for freedom and democracy would triumph and succeed. She remained throughout her life a tireless advocate for the dispossessed and the marginalized. She was a voice for the voiceless. In the coming days, as we mourn the passing of this heroine of our struggle, let us reflect on her rich, remarkable, and meaningful life. Rail workers across France have launched a strike in protest at the economic policies of Emmanuel Macron. Here's more on that and other stories making headlines from around the world. French rail workers have begun three months of rolling train strikes on Tuesday. Strikes are planned across France for two days out of every five until June 28th. It's going to affect 4.5 million passengers. It's believed to be the largest industrial action against President Emmanuel Macron's economic reforms. State Railway SNFC staff are leading the strike. 77% of the SNFC drivers have walked out along with energy and waste collection staff. Air France employees have also joined the strike on Tuesday. At least nine people have been killed across India during violent protests by low-caste communities on Monday. 
Tens of thousands of Lokas members, also known as Dalits, were protesting against a Supreme Court ruling that they claim weakens their status. The protesters attacked buses and government buildings, blocked trains and major roads and clashed with security forces. Dalits are among the most marginalized groups in a country where caste discrimination remains widespread despite being outlawed. This is the voice of the people. Every low caste or Dalit member of the country is protesting against atrocities being inflicted on us across India. There is resentment and anger. An airstrike by Afghan forces on a suspected Taliban gathering in the northern province of Kunduz has killed more than 50 people in day. According to the local authorities, Taliban members were killed along with civilians. They were attending a ceremony at a religious school when they were hit. In recent months, the Afghan government has been trying to push the Taliban to negotiation without any success. A Saudi-led strike has killed at least 14 civilians in the city of Hodida in Yemen. The missiles hit a housing compound, killing a dozen members of the same family, including seven children. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have been part of a civil war in Yemen against the Houthis since 2015. The war has killed more than 10,000 people and displaced more than 2 million. And with this, we've come to the end of this news brief. As you know, all the stories and more, you can find them on our website, telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Teresur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.